halfway up Ben Nevis, one of Scotland's greatest mountaineers is climbing Mega Route X, an almost vertical ascent of a 350 foot frozen waterfall. Dave Cuthbertson is at the leading edge of his sport. I actually found climbing quite scary, quite intimidating, and I didn't feel at all that I had a, a natural flair. Something inside me anyway had a, a some sort of driving force, a competitive element, and a wanting, uh, a determination to get better. I actually wanted to be the best climber in Scotland. Fifty miles away in the northern quarries of the Cairngorms, Graham Ettel and Rab Anderson are attempting a route that is so severe it's only been climbed three times before. This is one of the hardest winter routes in Britain, but for Graham Ettel, it's no more than just a nice day out. It's no different than somebody going out for a pleasant hill walk in the Lake District on a, on a January afternoon, just a few hundred yards from the car. It's just, I've just taken it and progressed a little bit further than they have. What motivates me, I don't actually know, really. I think I'm probably, probably just mad. Climbing the Keoch Nose near Applecross are two of Britain's best post-war mountaineers. Well, it wasn't like this when we did it, <laughs> Martin Boyson's achievements on Summer Rock are widely respected, while everyone has heard of Chris Bonington's success on the world's highest mountains. Yet, in retrospect, one of Chris's happiest days was spent here on this Scottish crag. It was a blazing hot day. Uh, I remember that we'd really psyched ourselves up to climb it because, I mean, it looks phenomenally steep and phenomenally hard. And then I can remember that the kind of extraordinarily bubbling kind of discovery that, God, this is easy, you know, and, and that you were climbing in this incredibly kind of dramatic kind of situation with these superb holes that your hands kind of went round and, and one just shot up it and, and, and there was an extraordinary sense of kind of elation, euphoria. On Bucholet of Moors, North Buttress, the maester is at work. Edinburgh architect Jimmy Marshall is a legend in his own lifetime. A climber of unsurpassed skill who put up dozens of bold new routes, he encouraged successive generations of younger climbers. Now, 30 years later, at our instigation, Jimmy is back in Glencoe. We were obsessive about our climbing. Bloody crazy, you know. All you could think about from one weekend to the next was what you'd get at when you got up to the Glen. It was a terrifically exciting place. And of course, there was a great history attached to it, so that you could follow the kind of history or development of climbing by your own adventures on the rocks. It just ran your life. The absolute sort of raison d'etre. We spent so much time climbing. We were like professional mountaineers. With all the Scottish peaks long since scaled, climbers like Dave Cuthbertson seek out new challenges on comparatively small pieces of rock. This Glen Nevis rock face may not look much. It's only 80 feet high. But if Dave is successful, Ring of Steel will be the hardest route yet climbed in Scotland. This well-rehearsed technical exercise bears little relationship to climbing's original purpose. Yet, in a real sense, all of the great post-war climbers in Scotland, the Marshalls, Bonningtons and Cuthbertsons, are merely carrying on a tradition that was created a hundred years ago in the golden age of mountaineering. In the sport of mountaineering, uh, there are moments that just don't come back. There was a golden age in the Alps around the time of the ascent of the Matterhorn, the 60s, the 70s. And there was a, a golden age here on Ben Nevis, on Sky and elsewhere. Uh, you can't uh, re recapture these, uh, these great days. Many are the memories one can bring back from the mountains, but they're all memories of freedom. 
The restraint of ordinary life no longer holds us down. We are in touch with nature. The sky, the winds, the waters, and the earth. Nowhere in the British Islands are there any rock climbs to be compared with those in sky. Measure them by what standards you will, length, variety, or difficulty. These are the words of the first great climber in Scotland, an English chemistry professor called Norman Colley. Colley came to Skye in 1886, fell in love with its mountains, and explored the entire Coolin Ridge with the local guide, John Mackenzie. Hey, well done, John. Professor Norman Colley was an eminent Victorian. He was one of the greatest scientists of his age, taking the first medical X-ray pictures and constructing the first neon lamp, whilst also being a painter and a cartographer. Above all, he was an outstanding mountaineer who climbed in the Alps and the Canadian Rockies, as well as in Scotland itself. His contribution to Scottish mountaineering was to preempt the Scottish mountaineers themselves. Uh, the wind was really taken out of the sails, for example, when he climbed Tower Ridge and made the first ascent and the first winter ascent of Tower Ridge and Ben Nevis. People started climbing the sky well before they started climbing in Ben Nevis and Glencoe because it was easier to get to it. Well, the corner of it, John. Looks too steep here. I think there's no doubt that the Cullen was uh, Collie's particular enthusiasm. He uh, began to climb here in 1884, and he climbed here for several years before he became involved with uh, alpine climbing. He spent something like 20 summers uh, up here until the start of the First War, and then, of course, he returned here and stayed here for 12 years from 1930 till his death. So the Cullen was his... Uh, his love. This is the Scottish Mountaineering Club Library. Norman Colley was a member of the club for 50 years and contributed regularly to the club journal. His writings tell us something of his character, revealing an almost mystical reverence for the Scottish hills. Here was a scientist with a soul who not only climbed all the major mountains on sky, but mapped them and measured them as well. The original Born and Survey maps were everywhere wrong. Uh, people had only begun to climb there in the 1870s. As far as I could make out, uh, what the Born and Survey had done really was to obtain heights for Scourn and Gillian and uh, Bruch and Free. Um, and the rest was really just a kind of eye sketch without any detailed surveying. Um, so uh, when Collie started climbing here, uh, the maps were essentially uh, uh, useless. Uh, the mountains were all in the wrong place. The first mountain Collie climbed with Mackenzie was Ambastier. With its twin peaks, it was one of the Coolin's most prominent landmarks. when you've got sky. Retracing Collie's route up Ambastur are two experienced mountaineers, John Lyle and Alan Kimber. 
dressed in period climbing costume and sporting a deerstalker, Lyle plays John Mackenzie, while Kimber is a flat-capped Norman Collie. Whenever he came to Skye, Norman Colley climbed with John Mackenzie. No one else would do. Theirs was a friendship of the mountains, which was first forged on Ambastia. A loose rock up here in the bed of the gully. That's the rope. There's no more rope now. I'll wait here, John. Good. John, follow on. So what is the modern verdict on this climb, first made in 1889 with fairly primitive right gear? Climbing equipment, the rope and the boots, things like that, I mean, they've developed such a lot, but so has the sport and the difficulty of things that people do. Uh, that's been needed, but I think, in a sense, for the time they did it, this was this was superb. Mm -hmm. The clothing is uh, is not too bad. The collar's a bit stiff. I wouldn't fancy wearing these collars anymore. I don't know how they got on with those. And as for the tie and the cufflinks, it's uh, it's a bit peculiar. I found these boots a little bit hard to get, come to terms with, especially on the basalt dike areas. If the, if the rock's rough, it's uh, they, they grip quite well. But there's a certain angle beyond which you have to be a bit careful. Well, we need to try to groove here, I think. Oh, you'll need a leg up. You're lighter than I am today, anyway. How about if you stand on my shoulder? That would help. Yeah, try this. Okay. I'm set. That's fine. Don't take too long. How much porridge do you eat this morning for <laughs> breakfast? Uh, it was that venison last night. You're right. Was it that one it was? Oh. Too many profiteroles. Good. Well done. 
Uh, if you can tie the rope off at the top, I'll pull up on it. Yeah. If I need to. Almost certainly. Right, when I say pull, pull. Are you ready? I'm ready. Pull! who seemed to have so much interest in mountain sky, the Alps, and he went to the, the Rockies, way out into the back end of, uh, of Canada. Very exciting, I would think, to just go into a place no one has ever been to before, as far as you can make out. And there is a certain feeling of excitement about it. Norman Colley was lucky to be in at the start of things, to be an explorer of mountains rather than a follower in others' footsteps. Colley was to climb every peak on Skye. Not that he advertised his triumphs. Let lesser mortals write up their roots in the mountaineering journals. A modest summit cairn was good enough for him. Fame came to Norman Colley. He didn't seek it out. Most mountaineers leave a legacy of the details of the first ascents, but Norman Colley wasn't like that. He disliked the idea of recording his roots in such minute detail. In fact, he said it was like stripping the mountains of their mystery. He was more interested in exploration and the discovery of mountains like these, undeniably the most impressive in Britain. One of his greatest discoveries was the Keoch, a huge tower of rock distinguished by its characteristic shadow. Colley first climbed it with Mackenzie in 1906. Which way now? Well, the Keoch is a thousand feet high, a daunting prospect for early mountaineers. We'll try this way. Do you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. Got a good anchor here. Well done, excellent. Partners on the mountain, Mackenzie and Colley, came from very different social backgrounds. The attraction of opposites is how Alan Kimber sees it. Colley had travelled the world. He was a, a great scientist, a chemist, a very good teacher, a very clever person. And John Mackenzie, a, a crofter from down the road at Sconser, never even left the island of Sky, you know. But they both got on so well together. They appreciated each other's company and each other's own ability in a different sort of way, I think. Well, Fine climbing, John. Fine climbing. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. Which way do you think? So get to that point.
that, John? My main feeling about Collie was the way he created friendships with one or two particular people, um, people like Mummery in the Alps and Hastings, maybe. He got on very well with them in a climbing sense, and I think that was the important thing as far as Collie was concerned. I'll stay here, John. Excellent. Very good. Collie made several trips to the Alps in the 1890s, but he much preferred Sky. Too many tourists at Zermatt, he said. Too much undesirable humanity. Beautiful climbing, John. That's lovely. How are you? Fine. Yeah, doing good. Looks all right. With its remoteness and its wild beauty, Sky was Collie's perfect place. Whatever his shortcomings, and he could be arrogant and aloof, Collie was a loyal and generous friend. When asked to address the Alpine Club, he sang John Mackenzie's praises. He is the only real British climbing guide that has ever existed, Collie said, and a first-rate rock climber. Inevitably, though, it was Collie who picked up the honours. Presidency of the Alpine and Cairngorm Clubs and Vice Presidency of the Royal Geographical Society. He even had a mountain named after him on Sky, Skur Haramich, his Gaelic for Norman's Peak. I would say that Norman Cop should be considered to be right up there amongst the best of the exploration climbers in Scotland. And he was around at a time when there was a lot of exploration and he was at the forefront of it. He's discovered a lot of fine routes, Tower Ridge on Ben Nevis, he made the first ascent of that in only five hours. And a lot of people take 25 hours over a weekday. That's you, John. A key off. We're nearly there. Now it's going all the way. That's right. It looks wonderful. Of all Collie's classic routes, the Kioch was the one he climbed most often. With its circuitous path, its cracks, gullies and traverses, it was full of interest. The climb comes to a spectacular conclusion. To reach the top of the Keogh's Tower, mountaineers have to cross the knife edge of rock that acts as its drawbridge. With a sheer drop on either side, this is no place for people of a nervous disposition.
Climbing mountains, Collie said, was like entering a new world. Essentially a private man, Collie was a reticent hero from the golden age of mountaineering. In his 80s, Collie became a brooding and isolated figure, haunting Sky Sligachan Inn. One of the last to see him was a young RAF pilot on sick leave during the war, who wrote in his diary, We were alone in the inn, save for one old man who'd returned there to die. His hair was white, but his face and bearing were still those of a great mountaineer. He never spoke but appeared regularly at meals to take his place at a table tight-pressed against the windows, alone with his wine and memories. <laughs> 